Dr. Herbert Pardis is the uh, president and CEO of New York Presbyterian Hospital. It's the largest private employer here in Manhattan. He's also a former assistant U.S. Surgeon General, and New York Magazine has named him to its power dozen list of really uh, the most influential New Yorker. So perfect person to talk to. Dr. Pardis, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure to be here. Nice to see you. Is it going to be very significant in terms of the changes that we're going to see in our health care situation? No question. No, no question. No. This is a big deal. And it's going to be a big deal in various kinds of ways. There are some very good aspects to the bill. There are some aspects to the, to the bill that I would have liked better. So it's a kind of a mixed bag, but there are a lot of good things in it. What does it mean for hospitals specifically? Well, what it does is the hospitals in negotiations with both the Senate Finance Committee and the President's office uh, agreed to take a cut of $155 billion. I think you're going to see some hospitals close mm. over the next year or so. We've already seen some in the recent past, one of the most noteworthy being St. Vincent's. Mm. Uh, there are, the, the hospitals volunteered to take $155 billion in cuts, which mm. is a lot of money. We already are seeing very tight margins, particularly in the major urban centers like New York. Um, on the other hand, there's some very good things for patients. I think the elimination of the requirement of no pre-existing condition in order to get insurance is long overdue. I think the uh, elimination of lifetime caps on health care reimbursement is also a long-standing need. I think the idea that uh, families will be able to retain their uh, kids up to 26 years of age on their insurance is a positive, and the fact that more people are being in, in, uh, covered right. is good. Those are some of the good things. And now you said you'll see some hospitals close. What about consolidation, mergers? Do you think you're going to see some of your competitors uh, trying to position themselves better by combining operations? No question. You'll see consolidations. You'll see integration. One of the most difficult challenges will be for the isolated small hospital, which will probably not be able to maintain itself by itself. It has to go to a large system. And we're seeing some of that activity already around the country. Is that going to hurt, though, then smaller areas, I'm thinking, smaller regions around the country that are maybe served by those smaller hospitals? Well, one of the, one of the problems you have with that is that people who may have a hospital right in their neighborhood are going to have to go further. Right. I mean, St. Vincent's was a classic case mm -hmm. because to take St. Vincent's away, people had to go to other hospitals. Mm -hmm. Now, for the large hospitals, like New York Presbyterian, do they come out uh, better than this? I mean, will this, you know, you have more patients now. Will this, with more people being insured, will this help you in some ways if you're well, a large hospital? The, the bill works in an ironic fashion. If you had a state which had been very generous in allowing people to come on to Medicaid, mm. that there are less uninsured people. So they said, we'll give you a revenue stream because we'll cover the uninsured. In a state which was tighter on access, right. they got a lot of uninsured, so they're going to get a windfall. A state like New York is going to get hurt because many more people were, were uh, already on Medicaid. The problem in New York and many places like us is not that they're not covered at all is that they're covered inadequately. There's not enough reimbursement. And that's, you said things are going to be better. I mean, but truly, people are going to get more preventive care, more people are going to get care. You have no doubt about it that this is going to be a big step forward for Americans and the health of Americans. Absolutely. I think that's right. I think if you look at it from the patient's vantage point, there are a lot of good things in, in here. And I like the fact that there are better things for patients. I also want to make sure that the hospitals and doctors and nurses are there in adequate numbers and with enough reimbursement to take care of patients the right way. And that is one of your concerns. I think you brought it up at least over a year ago about the shortage of doctors. I have a niece who's, who's that's what she's hoping to do. But you don't hear a lot of people wanting to go to medical school. They're, they're, the cost of it is prohibitive. They talk about malpractice insurance being prohibitive. It's not necessarily where people want to go. Can we fix that problem? Well, they're trying. They've done some things. They've given an incentive payment for people in primary care and general surgery. And I still think there are a large number of people who want to go into medicine because they like the mission. Mm -hmm. This is not a, You don't go into medicine to become wealthy anymore. You go in it because you like the mission. So I don't know if the numbers have, have dropped that much, but the problem is we're going to be short. We're going to need something like 120,000 more doctors by 2025. Right. And we've got to get going in order to produce them. I have, Dr. Partis, let me ask you about one thing. My big question is, you know that there's been talk out of Washington by the Republicans that they want to block health care reform. Do you think that gains, I mean, the way we've been talking, it sounds like you expect it all to go through, but can they block it, do you think, in any way? No, I think there's going to be some fights about this. And I'm not sure it's all going to go through. I think that what you may find is that some of the congressional people will find ways of 
uh, tackling the money that's supporting part of these programs. I'm not sure that you'll see a big overhaul of the entire health care uh, bill, but there'll certainly be a big argument about it, and there may be some cuts in aspects of the health care bill. Is that going to make it then not a great piece of legislation, or well, do you still think it's going to be significant? I, I think there are some things I, which, uh, if taken out of there, I would have favored. I was not a big uh, fan of the uh, commission, which is supposed to be rate setting. Uh, so that's uh, up for grabs. Whether that'll be able to make it through or not, I don't know. But I think you're going to see a debate, and then you're going to see some parts of it possibly challenged. And they may challenge it by challenging the money that supports that part. Now, there's still some things in this bill that aren't addressing costs, like people flooding into these emergency rooms because they're not doing this preventative care, right. uh, the Medicaid uh, rebates. So how are you trying to, to cope with those? Which are every every hospital, with any, any hospital with any kind of vision is looking to be more efficient to try to help in terms of the health of the individual so they don't have to come as much, are doing preventive health care. We're also reaching out into neighborhoods where there are large numbers of people who may be indigent. In order to give them a more coordinated system, we're trying to lower the volume coming in. And we're trying to reduce infections, reduce falls, anything that might prolong or complicate the stay of a patient. What about, and this came up in, in the break, about undocumented folks right. that are out there. I mean, you expect that they'll still be in the emergency rooms and that will still contribute to costs. No question. And that affects certain states more than others. There are others. Some states don't have it at all. But undocumented are not covered at all. So as a result, we will see them. We will see them for all kinds of care, particularly in the emergency room. But you think the increased volume by everybody getting coverage and getting care, that that will make up for the cost brought in by those folks who still use the emergency room? No, I think, I think that uh, what, what health care uh, providers, hospitals and doctors, are going to find themselves operating with less money. And the, the, the challenge there, particularly in the hospital, is that the average patient is far sicker than they were 20 years ago. Right. So what you want is more staff, not less staff, to take care of them. Mm -hmm. But now, I guess maybe this is a bit of counterintuitive, but isn't bigger volume good for a hospital? Well, it's bigger volume is fine unless each additional volume is paying you less than what you should be paid. Right. Okay. So you and, don't and want high volume of people who, who aren't properly covered and who have very expensive... Well, f f first of all, we want to take care of patients. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I like to take care of everybody. Mm -hmm. But we also have to make sure the hospitals are there. Right. And the, the, in New York, as an example, and there are other states like Rhode Island, New Jersey, very tight margins. And so if you've got sicker people, often older also, we got to remember, right. who need much more care, you need more staff in the hospital, le le less. And if they cut the money too far, if we already agreed to our 55 billion, right. you start cutting more, then you're going to make it more and more difficult for us to adequately serve people. The main thing we want to do is serve people with top quality care, not with mediocre care. And you feel like you can do that under reform, just quickly? We're going to try as hard as we can. Okay, going to leave it there. Dr. Partis, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to see you.